prices for prescription drugs are on the rise. They have been for several years, adding to the overall increase in health care costs, especially for seniors and others on fixed incomes. Why are drug prices going up? Who's to blame? Is it the drug manufacturers, the insurance companies, or the health care system in general? What can consumers do about it? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Anyone who has a health condition and relies on prescription drugs to maintain their well-being has seen a significant increase in the cost of their medication over the last few years. For seniors and others who may be on multiple medications as well as a fixed income, the increased costs can be devastating. There are ways for consumers to cut corners, such as buying generic drugs if they exist, using mail order or even going to another country where the same medication may cost a fraction of what it costs here at home. Or is there a larger solution to this multifaceted problem? Our guests tonight include representatives from a retirement advocacy group, the medical industry, and a diabetic patient. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Jessica Woolley is the advocacy director for AARP Hawaii and a former member of the Hawaii State House of Representatives. Chen Wen Sang is a family physician and is on the faculty at the UH John A. Burns School of Medicine. She is a nationally recognized expert on Medicare Part D, which provides drug coverage to seniors and disabled persons. Kamalyn Matsuda is a doctor of pharmacy. She is an assistant professor at the UH Hilo, da Hilo Daniel K. Inoy College of Pharmacy and an assistant clinical professor at the UH Medical School. Her clinical interest is in diabetes. And Emil Sloboda has been a diabetic patient for 40 years and must take insulin every day. Now before we get started tonight, we do want to tell you that Insights on PBS Hawaii invited representatives of the pharmaceutical industry and the medical insurance companies to participate in this show, but they declined. Thank you all for being here. We welcome you tonight. Dr. Masuda, I want to start with you. Can you walk us through briefly how drugs are actually priced? So drugs are priced through a process beginning with the manufacturers. So the manufacturers will set a price for their medications, um, and it can vary depending on how much it took them to develop the medication as well. Um, and after they have a price for their drugs, then it goes to a wholesaler. The wholesaler will purchase it from the manufacturer and then put a price, another price on it to allow it to get to the pharmacies. Um, and then the pharmacies will dispense it to the patients, but it only get, gets reimbursed by what the insurance will cover if it is a medication that the insurance covers. When we look at how the prices have increased over the last few years, where is that increase in that tier that you're talking about? Where is that actually happening? Typically, it can happen mostly from the manufacturer of the drug. Um, and there's also another piece of the puzzle is a pharmacy benefit manager. So pharmacy benefit managers are companies that process your claims for the prescription that they get from the physician um, and process it through the insurance company. So they're a middleman that also charges, charges the insurance company a fee, but also charges the pharmacy a fee in order for them to make a profit. So that adds an additional cost to the medications as well. Dr. Singh, why have we seen the prices grow up so exponentially when it comes to drug, drugs as compared to perhaps the price of groceries or other, you know, essentials? Well, I think that's a really great question. And, um, you know, as physicians and definitely as patients, we've asked the same question. Um, and part of it is what Dr. Masuda said, which is, you know, the prices can be related to development of drugs. But also price, um, part of it is, is because it's an open market. It's a free market. So part of the pricing is really negotiated between, let's say, health plans who need to provide this drug to patients or pharmacy benefit managers that negotiate the price for them. But it's a negotiated price. So pharmaceutical companies in the negotiation will try to get their best price and health plans will try to get the pr best price. Now, as far as why the price is increasing, um, part of it is we've seen more new expensive drugs come out because they're newer and they might be better or effective, but not necessarily always. And I think it's also a question that we're trying to ask on a national level because we don't have, I think, 
um, so it's very confusing to some of us why drugs that have been around are seeing price increases um, when it's not clearly related to development. Jessica, I want to ask you, who's overseeing this? Who's the watchdog on this? Well, the consumers, you know, we are the public. Uh, there, there really isn't much oversight here, and that's part of the problem. Um, you know, Medicare is the largest purchaser of prescription drugs, and they don't even have authorization to negotiate the price. So you have a lot of power um, by the prescription drug manufacturers in particular right now. And as a patient, you're in a situation where you can't necessarily walk away. It's not like, okay, I'm not going to buy, you know, um, brand X because I can go to brand Y if you need this medication. You know, what are your options? You don't really have many options, and it really puts our Kapuna in a very difficult situation if they are income limited. So they're choosing between their medicine that they need to stay alive and stay healthy or, you know, food. Um, how have you seen the drug prices change? I know that you've been battling diabetes for 40 years now, so obviously you've had a lot of experience purchasing medication. What have you seen over those over those decades? Well, in preparation for coming on today, I actually went back and asked my mother, who is a medical school professor, among other things, and she told me that in 1980, when she went to the pharmacy to buy me a 100-unit vial of insulin, it cost eight dollars. Today, and since 2001, the price of insulin has gone up 300%. Um, when synthetic insulin first came out, it was called Humulin, um, I remember, and my mom remembers, that we never paid more than 18 to 20 dollars for a vial. Um, but that spike that happened after 2001 is intrinsically tied to these rebate deals and um, f deals that the pharmacy and the health insurance companies have to earn a profit. This is a profit business. It has nothing to do with who can get what. It has more to do with making money. And that's the plain reason, I think, for all of this. And that's why the pharmaceutical companies will not release their financials to Medicare or to the feds. You know, transparency is so much of this, just transparency in terms of being able to know what something is going to cost. Uh, when a doctor is prescribing medication, do they even know what that's going to cost their patient? It's actually extremely difficult. So, you know, we talked about that this is an open market, but one of the problems is it's very hard for us when we see patients and we, for instance, um, even if there's multiple drugs we could choose on that might be effective, we have to figure out which one's covered which, uh, what the co-payment would be. And we don't have that information often uh, in the same way that our patient may not have it. Uh, so when we talk about trying to be good consumers, trying to be smart shoppers, trying to do the right things for our patients, our patients trying to do the right things for themselves, uh, we don't know what the cost of the drug will be. If we don't know whether there's a cheaper cost because a plan has negotiated a cheaper cost, it's very hard for us to, to know what we're doing. Um, as part of it, Dr. Masood and I have been working for years on something called a prescribing guide, a website to even help physicians and pharmacists figure out what's covered and potentially what the copayment will be. But probably one of the main messages is that we really have to be smart about this. It's not easy. There's a lot of work to put into it, but um, we have to figure out how to find a, a better way for this. How do we avoid that sticker shock when you're suddenly at the counter at Long's and you find out what your payment is right then? I mean, is there a way as a consumer to find out ahead of time so that you can be a smart shopper? It seems like a lot of onus is on the patient, and that seems very difficult if a doctor is saying, here's the drug you need. You're not thinking like, oh, and let me also ask, like, what is this going to cost me? Because as she said, the doctor may not even know. So a lot of it is t discussing with your insurance company. Um, they usually, you can call them and ask them for a medication if it's on their formulary or a preferred drug that um, the insurance will cover. And it, especially when you're choosing an insurance, if you have the opportunity, if you're working, you can select insurance. You want to be able to choose uh, insurance that will cover most of your medications and be aware of what the cost will be if you're paying for a brand or a generic. 
Uh, for Medicare patients, they have what's called a tiering system, so they pay a price for a generic medication, a lower cost for a generic medication that the insurance will cover, a higher cost for a generic medication that the insurance doesn't cover, but even a higher cost if it's a brand medication that they cover, and the highest cost would be a brand medication that they don't cover. Um, so yes, as a consumer, it's good to shop around like any high price item you're paying for, you want to look for an insurance company that will cover most of your medications. But I think also, um, unfortunately, when you do go to the pharmacy, even the pharmacist won't know exactly what your copay is until you actually process the prescription. Um, and so that's what would be good to have as well as more transparency so that the patients will actually be able to figure out what their costs would be before they get that sticker shock when they go to the pharmacy as well. Is that something that needs to be mandated at the state level, at the federal level? I mean, how would we actually get that? I think you probably would need um, more at the federal level because all of the insurance companies, well, most of them have uh, federal ties and are available nationally. HMSA is a local insurance company, but it, they're tied with Blue Cross Blue Shield as well. There actually is a, um, so for instance, Medicare, which runs the national Medicare Part D benefit for like 40 million people, they're coming out with suggestions that, so for instance, when I'm a physician, I'm typing in the prescription to send electronically to a pharmacist uh, to really start looking at maybe a mandate or requirement that the electronic prescribing system I'm using actually has that cost information right as I'm doing it. So I can have that conversation with you directly and say, look, this is um, how much it's gonna cost in terms of uh, 50 bucks or $5, Does that is that affordable for you? So I, I think that's actually gonna be really important, so. Um, we wanna bring the audience in. Please do get your questions in. Tom in Waikiki has a question that I think is great for you, Jessica, and that is what role does our political system have in the price of drugs? That's a great question. And AARP has actually just launched a campaign on pr prescription drugs and trying to bring the price down for consumers. The issue has just really become so critical as the price in America is higher than any other place in the world. So often we're playing, paying twice the cost um, of other people in other countries. So there's no question that we have to take action. Uh, there is a federal effort. There are you know, probably four different prongs at the federal level at this point, and then on the state level there's a lot of different efforts. Uh, in the last year there's been 17 states that have passed 26 bills into law. Um, at the federal level, I think it's um, a conversation happening right now, and one of the things we talked about was authorizing Medicare so that they can actually negotiate with other countries um, for their prescription drugs, or just negotiate, period, right? Um, and that's one of the talks that we're having right now, and potentially people can make a difference by speaking up, uh, letting their congressional members know these are critical issues for them, um, whether it's at the state level or the federal level. Um, now is the time, because um, there's actually just action in the Senate today on several bills. So the other thing that we're trying to do is really cap the out-of-pocket costs for those Medicare folks in particular. So the Medicare Part D costs can be very high for some Kapuna, and so we really need to um, address those costs, and there are different ways that um, the federal government can do that. So the other thing that is a real challenge is the um, there are ways that our current manufacturers prevent generics from getting to market. So there's like these pay to play deals that they um, kind of require. Um, there's also w other ways that they prevent them from coming to market. So we need to eliminate some of those loopholes. And then I'd say the final one is just transparency. You know, there's multiple ways we can um, open up the information. We can, you know, I think focus on the manufacturers in particular, you know, find out um, why they're setting the prices so high, um, particularly when it's, you know, cheaper everywhere else. Um, at the state level, um, you know, there were actually a couple bills that were moving through the session and, you know, kind of died at the very end. Uh, I think that this year might be another good year. Um, we have a couple ideas, and one of them includes, you know, letting the state negotiate with other countries. Um, other states have already done that, so that's one that we've heard people really support. Um, there's other that, others that deal with the pharmacy benefit managers, that transparency aspect. Um, or just you know requiring if there's a dramatic price increase, um, there be you know the insurance companies get advance notice. Um, so there's you know the state level people are still talking. I think the important thing is that we have the conversation. Like I really appreciate Emil coming forward to speak up because 
you know, people don't necessarily want to share all their personal problems about medication, but now is the time to tell their story. Um, that's going to make the difference because unless our leaders, our legislators understand what's happening at the ground level, how people are suffering, how people might be rationing their insulin and dying, um, they're not going to understand. So um, AARP is actually encouraging people to tell their stories or learn more at our website, you know, aarp.org backslash rx. You'll learn a lot. Um, and please, you know, encourage people to tell their stories so that we can learn, keep having this conversation. Well, and tell, tell it, us a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's not a mistake, I think, that insulin is the subject that made it into the public sphere to sort of shore up this discussion about the outrageous pricing with prescription medication. And the reason I say that is because you can't shop around for a better insulin. If I don't have insulin for 24 hours, I die. That's it. And it really doesn't matter how much I have to pay for it if I want to preserve my own life. So that's where the pharmaceutical companies begin with this product. They know there's a portion of the population who will do anything that they can do to get that insulin so they can avoid the complications that come, including death, diabetic ketoacidosis, metabolic shutdown. It all comes within 24 to 48 hours of no insulin. And we do read accounts uh, of people rationing, rationing insulin or trying to make it last longer. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, and see, ironically, uh, when I think about that, I think to back, because now I have Quest. Um, it's only been a couple years, but before that, I had HMSA, PPO, the best insurance money could buy. And what I was left with was, when I went to the pharmacy to pick up my two-month supply of insulin, I had to pay $235 copay. Now, $235 out of your monthly budget to keep yourself alive when you're raising three children in Hawaii, you understand that's a huge chunk of your monthly budget that you have to spend just to avoid having all of the complications that come with this disease. It's the leading cause of death in America. It's the leading cause of blindness in the world. It's the leading cause of amputation in the world. It's the leading cause of kidney disease in the world. I could go on and on. So on top of all that, you have to worry about how you can make your insulin last as long as it possibly can. So rationing is a really dangerous, extreme thing that I only had to do a few times. But what I did find myself doing a lot was, we get insulin pens that have, say, 200 units of insulin in the pen. You dial the dosage up, you inject it. You dial it up, you inject it as you go. But at a certain point, there's a little bit of insulin left in the pen, but you can't use the pen anymore. So I, like a lot of diabetics, against medical advice, take a syringe and withdraw that leftover insulin because that's a whole nother dose. That's a whole nother fifth of my day that I can stay alive. And the same thing with the insulin pumps. They last for three days, you remove them, there's excess insulin left over. No healthcare professional is going to tell you that you should ever do anything with that except throw it away. But I would extract the excess insulin that was left over and then reintroduce it to my next insulin pump because I didn't know if my insulin was going to last long enough for the time period that the health insurance company would allow me to then re-up my prescription and purchase more insulin. Diabetes, the amount of insulin you take from day to day can change. And if I took more or a lot less, then I would have excess or not enough insulin. And having to make those changes when you have big pharma, uh, these benefit managers, health insurance companies, physicians, all their hands in the pot, um, the immediacy of the need for insulin becomes all the more real when all these other people have to make decisions just so you can get what you need to live that day. Doctor, when you hear someone making choices like that, that's pretty compelling. Right, and we, you know, I'm gonna to have to second what Emil's saying, which is we hear this all the time. And, you know, there's two parts to this. Along with insulin, I hear this for other things as simple as asthma, inhalers for asthma. Some of the inhalers cost $400 um, if they're not covered, or even if they are covered, they can cost $25 to $50 each month for just a single medication. Um, and 
you know, in one sense, there's a, something I really, really want people to know, which is uh, I want to hear those stories. I would much rather have somebody tell me, I can't afford my medication, or what can you do to help? And to spend the time to try to work that out, knowing that it's hard to do it, but looking for ways to find covered medications to do the prior authorizations or requirements to um, get something covered, or having those really frank discussions. We get that if the medication's not affordable, it's not helping anybody. So. Um, we have a bunch of uh, comments and questions coming in. Connie from the Big Island saying, the medication I'm using is so expensive, I'm experimenting with not using it. The price creates a mistrust of the medical community and undermines the basic tenant of care. I think that goes to what you're saying. As a patient, you don't want to necessarily have to tell your doctor, look, I, I don't think I can afford that. All right, and then the message to doctors is we really have to be aware of it. Uh, and at nationally, three in 10 people have trouble paying for their medications, and they go to skipping their medications, um, trying to not take it, or just not taking it all together, even, not even substituting anything else. Uh, and I want to gain that trust back. You know, I don't want to be seen, we, I don't think physicians want to be seen as we just sent a prescription and we don't care about the cost. I have to say a lot more often it's we just don't know. Um, people are, I think, feeling that it, the burden is a little too much on them when uh, they have to try to figure out where to cut the cost to be able to fill the prescription. Can they go to their doctor for help? And I would say on both sides, come and tell your physician. Come and tell your pharmacist um, when you're picking up the prescription. Have them call their doctor. And on the doctor's side, I would say um, even just ask first. Say, I gave you that prescription. How, are you being able to afford your medications? Is this a problem? Because I'm there, I'm part of your team. I'm there to advocate for you. I'm there to help and do whatever I can. Um, Mike in Waikiki has a question that Dr. Masuda, I think uh, you'd be great to answer this. What is happening with compound medications which doctors mix and prescribe in their own office? These are much higher priced than similar drugs from the pharmacy. Usually compounded medications come from compounding pharmacies, so there are very few left, um, at least on Oahu, I think there's two compounding pharmacies. So those are medications, usually that you can't get available that's made from a manufacturer already. Um, and unfortunately, most insurance companies, just because of safety issues and um, what they know is efficacious, will usually prescribe what the FDA approves and a manufacturer can make. So there are still some medications that can be compounded. Um, that the insurances will cover, but they're very far and few between these days. Jessica, uh, one person here remaining anonymous tonight wants to know, is the Affordable Care Act making a difference in the price of medication? Um, no, not, I mean, directly, it's not addressing the prescription drug issue. I think we really have to um, look at the transparency of what's happening, um, you know, really expose um, the different levels, I mean, it's, it's at different levels, right, when we talk about transparency. Um, it's even at the level at the pharmacist, right, um, say that your copay is going to be higher than the actual generic you could buy. Um, some states are now saying, let's, let's require that you reveal that information. Um, so there's a lot of different um, things that have not ever been addressed um, and, or talked about, right? Um, so that's one reason we've got to have this conversation right now. Uh, let me just throw out another number that um, ARP um, found, you know, just recently. So the average um, medic, you know, Kapuna might take about 4.5 prescription drugs a year. So the cost is about um, $26,000 a year. So at the same time, their um, Medicare, that medium Medicare benefits, $24,150. We're putting profits over people, so something has to change, um, and we have to, um, you know, address this greed. <laughs> That's what it is, plain and simple. And I would add a little bit to that. You know, there are things like legislation in the past which have traditionally looked at um, how do we get people drug coverage. So, for instance, with Medicare Part D, when we created in 2006, many people who are seniors didn't even have drug coverage, uh, and now 45 million people do just through Medicare Part D. The problem used to be just, did you have drug coverage or not? And it's completely changed. We're seeing people who have drug coverage um, and then the drugs are covered, 
but the drug coverage has changed in the sense of uh, people are being asked to pay more of the share of the cost. So people have deductibles. The first uh, time they buy a prescription they, in, under Medicare Part D, the first $415 is out of pocket until you're paying that completely out of pocket yourself. And even if we're not under Medicare, even for instance, if I have insurance through a commercial plan through my employer, um, we, I can have deductibles as well. So, and then when people, even when the drug is covered, we're paying more of the share of the cost. So it's not just whether we have insurance or not, it's just not whether the drug is covered. We have to ask our policymakers to really look at uh, instead of just expanding coverage, uh, we know that as long as the prices of drugs are going up, somebody is paying for it. If it's the consumers or us, if it's our taxpayers, if it's Medicare, or if it's the health plans. Uh, and, and I think that's really important for people to understand now when they're talking to legislators. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that point. Um, it's even if you don't take prescription drugs, this is an important issue because you're paying premiums that are higher and you're paying taxes because we all support this Medicare system. Um, and so it matters and, and we're talking about billions of dollars every year. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning of the show, we alluded to the idea of perhaps ordering these drugs by mail, um, going to another country. Is that a viable option, do you think, to, to do these mail orders? I know for a long time there were a lot of, you know, those pop-up ads, order your drugs from Canada and whatnot. Is that a safe way to try to lower your cost? Well, I would probably say no because you can't necessarily verify where they get their medications from, um, but it will be less expensive for you. Um, so you just want to make sure you do your... Uh, research as well and make sure this was a legitimate pharmacy and they they obtained their medications from um, legitimate manufacturers as well because you have no way of tracking exactly where they get their medications from but there are options some insurance companies if you do mail order through a US um, pharmacy that can mail the prescriptions to you if you get a three-month supply sometimes they provide a discount for the cost um, for your medications as well Mr. Toba, I'm not sure where he's writing in from, but he has a question that I think a lot of people would ask is, why is there a price difference at retailers like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club of the same drugs at the retailers? Why do I pay one, pr one price in one part of town and another at, you know, if I go across town? Right, uh, that's really important to know. So when we talk about smart shopping, so if a drug is not covered by insurance, then all bets are off. You really have to do the shopping. You have to um, just like anything else you shop for, if it's not covered by insurance and you're paying 100% of the cost out of pocket, it might be different at Long's and it might be different at Safeway or Walgreens or, or Walmart. Um, there is a website called GoodRx, www.goodrx. It's for profit, but it lets somebody put in a drug and look at the prices at different pharmacies. So we'll use that sometimes just to get a quick idea. Um, it's also important to note that if a drug is covered by insurance, it shouldn't make a difference where, which pharmacy you're filling at if that pharmacy um, is what we call within the network. It means that your health plan has contracted with a certain number of pharmacies within you know, where you live and they will, um, the price is actually negotiated by the health plan and it doesn't matter whether you fill at a Long's or a Walgreens as long as it's part of that network. Okay. So the biggest problem is if, uh, if, you, if it's not covered by insurance, you're paying the full cost, you should definitely shop around. But if it's covered, it shouldn't make a difference as long as that pharmacy is within your network. I know you've had experience on Quest and in private insurance. Um, tell us about the difference of those two experiences. Um, well, um, as I stated before, um, I was shocked at how much uh, PPO, HMSA, policy would have me pay for my prescription medications, especially insulin. Um, and switching over to Quest, there, there's no uh, copay when you go in to pick up your prescriptions. However, I did have the experience where when I started, my endocrinologist prescribed the name brand insulin um, made by Nova Nordisk that I've been taking for, I don't know how many years now, 30 years. Uh, he prescribed it in the pen injection. I went off the pump for a while. We decided to start me on the pen and the con continuous glucose monitor with pen insulin injections. I went to the pharmacy to pick up my first prescription. 
and it was some insulin I'd never heard of. Now, I just want to make the point that insulin is not cough medicine. It's not even a statin. It's something where they use biological means um, and biological materials to produce batches of insulin. It's an enzyme. So it's not like you can't mess it up. Okay, that's the first thing. So it's not like every batch of insulin is exactly the same. So you compile on top of that that my brand was changed and my doctor told me later that Quest changed everybody's without telling them. So I showed up, I saw this new medication, I didn't know anything about it except that it's insulin, so I'm to take it as I was taking the other insulin, but it wasn't as efficacious for me. I had some problems with it. Um, it had a lot of lag time between when I took it and when I needed it to act on the carbohydrates that I was intaking. So I had to go back to my doctor, discuss this with them. Um, as our physician panel member mentioned, um, he worked with me to get a request to my Quest insurer to change that. That took two weeks. So I was taking insulin that wasn't really helping me as much as insulin should for two weeks. Ultimately, diabetes is a disease of the small blood vessels. The sugar in your system, if it's not met up with by insulin, does damage to the small blood vessels behind the eyes, in the kidneys, in the feet, in the extremities. And so that damage takes place over a long period of time. So any, any deleterious effect to your blood sugar causing it to go high is doing long-term damage to your organs. So it's these little things and the discussion that we're having that exemplifies the point here, which is you don't shop around for insulin. That shouldn't be a reality. Really, no one should have to pay for insulin. That's the reality. 40,000 Americans every year since the year 2000 are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes alone. 30 million Americans have diabetes. 7 million currently take insulin to stay alive every day. This is a drug that should not have a price attached to it. And if it does, it should be the same small price for everyone who has to take it. Well, because when disasters hit, when things are in short supply, the diabetics are the first to die. Well, and a lot of those diabetics are seniors, we know. What kind of choices are you hearing that they have to make on this? And what can they do? Uh, you know, he's right. It, it's certainly hard to shop around for insulin. So what do you suggest for them? Go to AARP.org and <laughs> tell your story. You know, it's a real challenge right now. I'm hearing a lot of different people um, starting to speak up. So, um, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist, um, don't be shy, right? Um, and, I, and I do really want to encourage people to take part in our democratic system, right? You know, let your legislators know this is a critical issue and they have to take action right now because we're paying the price, um, not just personally for people who take prescription drugs, but all of us, we're paying the price. Um, and why are we, as a country, paying the highest prices in the world? We know there's a problem um, and we have to stop allowing the profit over people. Um, the caller is a physician and a patient says, is the panel aware that generic drugs are not chemically equivalent and it is impossible for the FDA because they cannot police them what can be done? This is Michael in Honolulu. I, I know that, uh, you know, I've had the experience of going to the pharmacy, getting prescribed one thing, but then the generic is given to me just, uh, you know, as a matter of course, because obviously it's cheaper. Um, what kind of control do you have over that, over getting the, the brand name as opposed to the generic? Um, and is this in fact true that the FDA cannot police generics? The FDA actually has um, testing for generics and does um, testing to uh, test if it's equivalent to the brand name medications and they actually have uh, a resource that pharmacists can use that show whether or not it's equivalent enough to um, release the medication and they have laws where pharmacists can switch from a brand medication to a generic if it is deemed um, equivalent to the brand medication. Um, so that is a cost of savings measure for the patient. Um, 
But if it's not working as well for you, then you can talk with your pharmacist or your physician and they can request for a brand name drug um, and list that on the prescription as dispense as a brand name drug only. Um, sometimes though your insurance may not cover the brand name and they would have to work with the physician to submit a request to get the brand name medication. This is, uh, there's a few questions here for doctors. One from Uncle Don that says part of the, well this is more of a, a comment tonight. Uh, part of the problem is that doctors are over prescribing so people are over medicating. Doctors are guessing when they prescribe. Um, that's just Uncle Don's opinion tonight. And Bob in Honolulu wants to know, are doctors allowed to receive compensation from drug companies? Well, actually, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we don't, re I, I won't say we, but I would say the vast majority of doctors actually don't receive direct compensation. So for instance, if I prescribe a cholesterol drug, I don't get a profit from what's prescribed. Um, and there's actually, having said that, there are, for instance, um, medications that are, um, for instance, cancer medications or injection infusion medications that physicians um, have to do within the office itself. And that's a sort of, I'm primary care, so that's sort of a different ball game, but there has been discussion about um, those specialty medications that need to be administered, um, especially by a physician in the office, and how those are priced, and whether physicians get a fee for administering them. But on top of all that, there actually is a website where you can look up whether your particular doctor has received any sort of funding from the pharmaceutical company, from something as simple as whether they had a free meal paid for, to are they on the speaker's bureau and do they receive a fee for that, or do they get, uh, are they doing research that is funded by it? And it's called openpavements.gov, and I believe that's a website. So. Uh, you just type in your doctor's name and look for it. So I check my name regularly. <laughs> our, our clinic actually, uh, <laughs> well, because I know I, I haven't done anything, but um, I serve on a national task force, so I have to check it. But our, actually, our clinic has a, a policy of um, not getting free meals from pharmaceutical companies. We, we appreciate the education, but we don't feel like it has to be linked to uh, anything that has a financial dollar attached to it. It's difficult for many doctors to make that choice though, isn't it? It seems like some, some struggle because, you know. It, it's a bigger question of um, when something new comes on the market or, you know, we, new drugs are developed all the time and physicians, we want to stay on top of things uh, and we want to know how things work. Now how we do that as a nation to understand how new drugs worth, work, whether it's worth the cost, whether it's different from an older, uh, less expensive drug that might work just as well. That's a very separate, very good question about how we keep on top of it, both as physicians and I think, you know, as patients as well. Yeah, I mean, as from a patient's perspective, that's pretty fascinating to know whether your doctor has, you know, um, had any of these benefits. It's sort of like keeping track of a lawmaker in a way. But I don't know that any of us would, take the time to do that and then, I mean, is, as a patient, would you do that? Would you like to research your doctor? Um, you know, I have in the past. Um, my father was an investigator for the Food and Drug Administration, so I happen to know that in the last 10 or 15 years, new laws were introduced regulating what type of gifts and how the gifts can be given by these pharmaceutical companies to try and make it not such a dirty, profit-driven business, but clearly that hasn't, those regulations haven't helped the underlying problem. There's some interesting questions, uh, and I think this is probably for you, Jessica, um, and I, I, I don't think this is the case, but uh, one question, one caller asking, is the United States the only country that has for-profit prescriptions? Um, when we talk about country, uh, drug makers selling prescriptions in other countries, surely those uh, medical companies are making money. Absolutely, yeah, they're making, um, they're making money everywhere. They're just um, making less. They're making, yeah, they're making a lot of money in the United States. Um, yeah, and I think that's one of the questions that Americans should have for um, Congress, right, and um, our government officials, we've got to change this, so. And on that point, Andrew, and, and perhaps this one is for you, Doctor, are the U.S. drug consumers subsidizing other countries that negotiate lower prices with drug companies for the same drugs? In other words, if the consumers in Canada are paying less, is that on the backs of us? That's a common refrain I hear in this political climate. Um, do, do, is, that, is that the case? Uh, I don't think it's directly the case, but what happens is a lot of new drugs that get 
um, produced and um, released. A lot of it is through the U.S. and um, the biggest market is the U.S. and we have free market here. Um, so the other countries kind of benefit from that because we have that innovation and we allow for that innovation. So um, uh, once the drugs are approved here, they will be able to get them cheaper. I mean, if they get the, go to other countries, then they might be able to use the same drug and um, get it from the manufacturer at a lower price because they don't have maybe, um, sorry, at a lower price. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I kind of want to follow up on that because I think most of us here would say we want pharmaceutical companies to produce to do research, to produce better drugs, and nobody's arguing with that. Um, what we want is also, you know, for those drugs to be affordable. So as Mio said, it shouldn't depend on whether you're a diabetic with money or you're diabetic without money or you're some, a cancer patient with money or a cancer patient without money. It, it shouldn't depend on whether you live in Canada or the U.S. or some other country. So, uh, the major pharmaceutical companies, some are in the United States, some are in other countries like Israel and, and Europe. Having said that, um, for the United States, our government funds a lot of research. And so there has been a question of when we fund research to help pharmaceutical companies um, develop drugs or that help pharmaceutical benefit from this research, uh, what do we get back from it? And as a country, uh, why are we paying the most prices? And that sort of negotiation, we can understand if it's at a country level. It should not be at the patient level. It should not be at the physician level trying to negotiate those prices. And we're starting to question, should it even be at the health plan level, depending on whether you happen to sign up for one plan or another? Uh, and states are starting to say, should we get into this game of negotiating on a state level? And you know, as Jessica mentioned, we as Medicare aren't even negotiating at the Medicare level. Um, but the Medicaid, you know, for low-income people we are, for the VA Veterans Association we are, I think it's very important to have those discussions. And I'm not even a legislator or, but I can say when I see my patients come in, if they can't afford something, and I'm spending a lot of time fighting for that, um, I'll be honest, I think it's time physicians, many physicians are starting to speak up as well to say we need to keep this. Well, the, the difficult table. thing is you don't want to necessarily have your doctor, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of being able to look up the drug, see the price, and then have that discussion. But on the other side, I don't necessarily want that to be part of the conversation when it comes to my prescriptions to my health care. Right. And, and I may have misportrayed a little bit. What I really wanted to say was the question, uh, it used to be a few years ago, you couldn't even find out what doctors were getting. So it wasn't even open or transparent. And there was legislation passed to say it should be open and transparent so that now pharmaceutical companies have to report on a doctor level who's getting what. And I'm not saying you need to go and you know, do <laughs> research on your doctor, but I am saying it is good policy that pharmaceutical companies have to be open and transparent about where that money is going. Uh, and, and I think as a physician, um, healthcare provider, we have to be transparent with ourselves. You know when we want to be educated, does it need to come with a free meal? Um, when we want to go and educate other people, do we need a consulting fee? So, You know, I, I just like to say that I recently noticed that um, the United States Congress, the House of Representatives, held hearings on the very subject of the rise in insulin costs after all of the things in the media, the young man who lost his insurance plan and died rationing insulin. So my hope on a, from a, a national perspective is that we could get to one little piece of legislation that would address this one little slice of the healthcare uh, prescription drug conundrum. And that, with insulin as the poster child for the reasons I've already stated, would then trigger some type of forward thinking in addressing all prescription medication and how it factors into our health insurance market, the Affordable Care Act, and whatever we're gonna do to make it more affordable. Um, but then, I, the other thing I thought about is, if I were watching the show right now, I would wanna call in and ask a question to our pharmacy member, because I remember when I had HMSA PPO, um, and I had a insulin pump that was wire wirelessly connected to my glucometer, so I would, prick my finger, put a drop of blood on the strip, it would tell me my blood sugar, and then it would ask me, 
how much insulin do you want me to give you right now based on this blood sugar? The price of those test strips are right up there with insulin, over a dollar a strip. So if you buy 100 strips and you need to be under good control, and studies have shown diabetics who test their blood sugar more times are under better control. They've shown over and over again. So if you take it upon yourself to prick your finger five to 10 times a day, and that's over a dollar a strip, do the math. When I went to the pharmacy in Hawaii for the first time 11 years ago, and I had my HMSA PPO, I went up to buy my huge prescription of strips because I tested my blood sugar a lot. And the charge, the copay, was zero. HMSA doesn't charge their diabetic patients for test strips. Mm -hmm. They're free if you have HMSA PPO. Well, if you don't have the test strips, then you can't tell your insulin pump or dial up your injection and take the insulin you need because it's based on your blood sugar level. That's why they made the test strips free, so that people wouldn't have to guess and people could have better controlled diabetes. Well, the next step for HMSA in the state of Hawaii is to make insulin free, no charge. And then we won't even have to discuss the problem about people having to ration insulin. Because if you're rationing strips or you're rationing insulin, you're really rationing food. And I think everyone in this society agrees there's enough food to go around if you know where to get it. Well, what about that tactic about addressing a specific issue, a specific disease like diabetes, as opposed to taking on the whole um, prescription drugs as a whole? You know, the, the, the concern then is that certain drugs just don't get to be included, but we are talking about millions of, of Americans. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great idea. And I want to emphasize there are efforts right now, like the Senate just today uh, you know, passed through a, an important committee, the CREATES Act. So that is one piece of legislation that could really make a difference here. Um, but the devil's in the details, right? So that's why it's critical for us to raise these issues right now um, to speak to our legislators um, at the federal level and the state level because we have to take action um, in both areas, right? So, you know, I think that's a really interesting uh, proposition and given what we know about insulin and the price of insulin, um, I think it's a great conversation. I mean, the statistics we have are from 2015 showing that um, in one year the price went up 20%. You know, and there's no, there's no reason, so it's people need it, and they know, you know, people need it, and they're going to pay for it. So um, we've got to start asking those tough questions and, and not just taking it. Um, and we've got to insist that our le leaders take action. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Bob and Hoi Kai would like to know what would be the effect on price, uh, what would be the effect on price of drugs from a single payer system as advocated by Bernie Sanders and some others uh, in the Democratic Party right now? I'd, I'd love to open that up to any of you. I mean, it's hard to know, uh, like you said, the devil's in the details. Who knows what that single payer system would look like? But um, is that something that that would help? It could possibly help in other. Countries that have single payer systems, um, cost of medications is quite a bit lower. Um, what it will do, though, is limit the types of medications people can get. Um, so the ability to choose or select between different medications will be narrowed down, and everybody would have the same access to the same types of medications. How do we know that? Um, because that's what goes on in the other countries that have these types of medications. So if you, I mean types of um, socialized medicine. So if there's a one payer system, they're going to only contract with certain manufacturers to get the best cost for their medications. Um, so it will limit the amount that the types of medications that you are going to get. You're not going to, unless you want to pay for your different types of medications, they'll probably have that feature where you can pay out of pocket, which is the same case now. If your insurance doesn't cover medication, you, you're still able to get the medication. You just have to pay out of pocket for that. Or potentially, like I, in my case, have your physician lobby the single payee <laughs> to give you the medication that may be more expensive but is more efficacious for your particular case. So yeah, definitely if you're not if you're having problems with the medication, you can always request what's called a prior authorization to see if there's an alternative that you can select. 
And I'm so sure that type of option sense. would be available in, in Bernie Sanders' plan. Well, well, well we, so don't know. we don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly which was my of, initial yeah, question. How do you know? A lot of speculation. Yeah, you don't know at all. But, just but, but I think the same. point is there are other countries that have, um, you know, a national health insurance, mm -hmm. and, and we're not the only country struggling with this as well. So, yeah. um, the whole drug racket is nothing more. This is Dennis in Honolulu. The whole drug racket is nothing more than criminal extortion. The industry needs heavy profit regulation. All drug advertising should be eliminated. We haven't talked about that piece, and that is the tremendous amount of money that drug makers are spending on all those ads that we see in magazines and on television. Uh, how much does that influence the cost of, of medications? Well, I don't think we know exactly, but I can tell you what I know is that we're, they're spending more on marketing and advertising than research. Right, so we we do have some general numbers, um, but yeah, there's um, there's a problem because they're spending a lot of money marketing, um, a lot of, you know, and there's different types of drugs as well. So um, it depends on what your doctor is prescribing, but and what your medical condition is. But some of the um, brand drugs are extremely expensive, and people need to take them. Um, you know, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to sort of dial it down because I know we were sort of at the 30,000 foot level. But um, as a patient who's navigating this, if you are prescribed a new medication or you're having that conversation with your doctor, what do you advise? How do we include this so that, you know, you're not shocked when you get to Long's or wherever you may fill your prescription? I think the first thing, again, I'll go back to my main message at the beginning, which is it's just communication. You have the, every right to tell your health care provider, your family doctor, your primary care doctor or your specialist to even just start the conversation. Do you know how much it'll cost? Um, and then if it's too much or even if it's just costing quite a bit, say, um, I can afford it or this is hard on me, just get that conversation going. And then from the physician side, it's check in with your patient, see how it is. We understand it's hard to figure out what's covered, hard to figure out the cost, but it's way worth it when it, it beats not taking the medication or trying to uh, cut back on it. So that and talk to your legislators. When you're <laughs> and at, talk to your pharmacist. <laughs> well, when you are like at the, the doctor's pharmacy. advice. <laughs> <laughs> when you are at the pharmacy counter, uh, there might be a feeling that you're kind of too late, are you? Uh, too late for, no, I think if you, you get the cost of your medication and you realize that's too expensive, you know, ask to speak to the pharmacist, see if there's alternatives that might be at a lower cost. Um, they can contact your physician and see if they would be willing to make a change or even just writing down the names of the medications and you can, as the person, can contact your doctors to see if there's alternatives. Um, of course, not like in Emil's case, you know, the insulins work differently, but there are some that you can get actually over the counter that are at lower cost um, at different pharmacies as well so you know pharmacists can help with providing some alternatives as well that yeah. might be cheaper I, yeah. I'm gonna second that it is never really too late I mean pharmacists I've spent more time than I would like sometimes but pharmacists and, and um, physicians we work really strongly as a team we get that they are first line when you go and get your medications on how to use them and how much it costs and we want that feedback um, we don't like having to do all the extra work to try to figure it out, but we, they're just a completely invaluable um, part of the team to help the people we take care of. So it is not too late. Definitely. And I know that you are encouraging people to share their stories. AARP.org backslash RX. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to give you the last word tonight. Why is this so important? It's really important to me. And actually, I want to go back to the gentleman who rang in from Waikiki about the criminal extortion. What's important to me is that everyone see the true big picture. This is a for-profit situation. The fact made by Jessica that companies are spending more on advertising than they are on research and development makes perfect sense in the case of diabetes. I represent 40,000 people every year who will be paying outrageous prices for insulin, and they have no choice but to pay those prices to preserve their life. So why would I ever conduct research to cure that disease? It is so much profit and it's guaranteed. 40,000 at least every year have to buy this insulin. And this insulin, whose price has gone up 300% since 2001, is a cash cow, for lack of, you know, they used to use cows to make insulin. 
It's a cash cow for lack of a better term. And remember, the inventors of insulin didn't even want to patent it because they thought that no one should ever profit off of insulin. And the two scientists of the three who did agree to, to make the patent sold it for one Canadian dollar. And yeah, they were Canadian, where they get their insulin for really cheap, by the way. Okay, well thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we thank you for joining us tonight. Again, we do want to emphasize that we did invite representatives of the pharmaceutical companies to join us tonight, but they declined that invitation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Of course, we also thank our guests, Jessica Woolley with AARP, Advocacy Director there, along with Kamlin Masuda, Doctor of Pharmacy, Chen Wen Sang, Family Physician, and Emil Sloboda, Diabetic Patient. Thank Insights you. will take a break next Thursday for the July 4th holiday, but we'll be back the following week, week for a discussion on Indigenous agriculture and how it can contribute to our food sustainability. Be sure to join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Until next time, ahui ho.